We are very excited to have you today for our spotlight. We are um, going to be talking about something extremely unique, um, the scent of Parkinson's. Before we get started, if you would please uh, pop open your chat box. That's where you're gonna ask your questions today. And also give us a shout out and let us know where you're joining us from. Because our speaker today is from Scotland. She's joining us from Perth, Scotland. And so this is evening time for her. So we're very excited to um, be able to have her join us, even though it is in the middle of her evening. Um, so for those of you who might be your first time joining us with PMD Alliance, my name is Anissa Mitchell, and I'm glad to have you with, to, with us today. And we are um, going to be uh, hearing from Joy, who is the woman who smells Parkinson's. And some of you may have actually uh, heard about her or have seen an article um, about her. I know this came up a few years ago, um, as this is something extraordinarily unique that she um, noticed in her own husband and in others. And um, from that, she started a collaboration with uh, some scientists in the UK who are now studying this and how this might be able to help us in terms of finding a way to, to diagnose Parkinson's sooner, um, which we all know is very beneficial, especially if we get some of the disease modifying treatments, we want them the earlier that we can get them um, in the disease process. So she has been involved in some several exciting research projects that I know she's gonna be talking about. So she's gonna be sharing her story, how all this transpired, and then where she is in terms of her work um, with uh, the Parkinson's of UK and the researchers at Edinburgh uh, University. So I'm gonna turn this over to Joy. Thank you for joining us, Joy. Good evening, everybody. I am actually very honored to be speaking with you tonight because uh, during lockdown, I spent uh, many hours watching the various webinars that um, you yourselves were watching. So that's really nice. Now I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to, aha, I've got two up. Right, hang on, wait till I go, I'll go to one and see what I've got. Is it coming up? No. Share. Yeah. You've got it. I'm seeing the um, the slides on the side, so it's not in slideshow yet, but you definitely seem to have it on the right screen. Good. It's always fun when you have multiple screens and you're trying to figure this out. Yes, it's, it's sometimes difficult, right? Is it on slideshow now? No. It should be now. Lay from the start. Try, look, there you go. Now you're on, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I am, um, you'll see why my slides are a bit different in a few seconds. It's a smell led study from Parkinson's and our motto is nose to diagnose. So um, you don't reach, and I always say it's serendipity. Les and I met when we were 16. Um, we had our you know, ups and downs and arguments, etc. But we stayed together um, and through it all. So the serendip, you don't plot a course for it. You have to set out with good faith as we did, very much in love. And then you, you lose your bearing serendipitously, really. So I have um, familial hyperosmia. My grandmother had it. My two sisters have it as well, but my grandmother trained me. She realized that I had a very much um, more sensitive smell than my sisters. So the hyperosmia is very good for smelling things. But once I started doing this work, um, a neuroscientist says to me, well, what else do you feel? And I said, well, there's color and there's sound and I get a reaction at the back of my throat to the top and, uh, and sometimes I get a real shiver. And he said, I think you've got synesthesia as well. So the combination of being a synesthete 
and having hyperosmia is what has brought this to the fore. Now, I show you a picture here. You can see the shadows in the leaves. You can see the sunshine. You can see the plants underneath. But that is not what I see. I see this. Um, and it's quite difficult. The perception is quite difficult because I know that that smell, because the sun on it is going to be different. And I have drawn this myself. I am also an artist. You can see the darkened areas where the smell again is different. So leaves, this one is in the shadow. And then these are the smells of the leaves. There is um, a bud about to come out. That smells different. And then these are these smells coming up from underneath. It is a very pleasant sensory walk that I go on in the garden. But this one was different. As an artist, I drew bergamot and lavender. She passed me. I could tell exactly where she had spread the bergamot and lavender on her body. And that was what I drew. And my lecturer came up to me and he said, what on earth have you done? He said, the shadows and the light aren't in the right place. I said, no, but the bergamot and lavender is. And we had a discussion, the, the, uh, uh, pose, the girl who was posing and I, and she says, yeah, it's exactly how I put it on my body. So why? Why should I be able to have a medical olfactory library? I did nursing. So if you look at it, medicine, you're looking at all sorts of medicine, leukemia, lymphoma, three years study, and it was in Nightingale wards, there would be at least 32 beds in the ward, in winter there would be five down the middle. So I acquired these smells, and only twice did I smell Parkinson's in my early career. I am 72, so here I was, 19, 18 in actual fact, um, and then surgery, cancers, abdominal, cardiac, ENT, but you know, the worst smell for me was in maternity. It's the placenta. It uh, can be very different from patient to patient. And I can actually tell when somebody's a smoker. So there is my husband. He was a consultant anesthetist. Uh, when Les was 31, uh, 32, he began to be, uh, I began to be aware of a change in his smell. Now the smell started he had shiny skin with spots, and you can see some of them here, just there, here, a bit of red, a big one there. And I don't know whether any of you have the experience of uh, a lot of earwax, because earwax is sebum as well. But most of the smell was on the back of his neck, and that's where the biggest sebum glands are. But he wasn't diagnosed until he was 45. So how did I relate this. So we go to our first Parkinson's UK meeting. Uh, we come back to Scotland, we come back to home. Les was a, a niece with us down in England. I discover that the others with Parkinson's in that room smell the same as Les. And I was sitting there, it was quite a, an unnerving moment. I got to home, I sat him down, and I said to him, um, I've got something to tell you. I said, you know, I have this phenomenal sense of smell. And I said to him, those people in that room smelt the same as you. And he looked at me and he said, what are you talking about? And I repeated it. He said, well, we've got to go back. We've got to go back in a month. We've got to have it verified. You know, the doctor ended up just wouldn't take it. So then his next problem was, as a scientist, he had done quite a lot of study in anaesthetics and research um, in Liverpool he had to find the right person. So I went to a stem cell research uh, lecture. It was by Dr. Tilo Kunath and I stood up and I said, and it was, I assure you, an out of body moment. Why are we not using the smell of Parkinson's to diagnose it earlier? Total silence. He asked me to repeat it and I said to him, I could tell you who has Parkinson's in the seats around me. And he said, could we speak about this later? So later it was, and we got to the fact that, well, why? 
he did, wanted to find out some papers and see what, what it meant before he contacted me. Why does Parkinson's smell and why is it not in the neurological picture? ENT here, of course, is the loss of smell. It isn't about the fact that it has a smell. But increased sebum is not unknown in Parkinson's. Cohn and Sarbo, Camus and Roussey and Bailey and Bremner were scientists and the dates are fairly early. But Dressel and Frederick Louis, now most of us know Frederick Louis, he wrote a paper with Dressler about it. But David Creston, he was the one that was more persistent. He started off in London and he was not, it was not accepted. Uh, his paper was not accepted and he went to Philadelphia and it wasn't accepted there either. He came back, he was totally rejected and went off and literally did nothing in medicine. So people with Parkinson's often present with a waxy appearance and this was what, this is one of his photographs from 1927 and here is the waxy appearance all over. Um, there is a younger girl, actually a YOPD in this paper, who has a lot of the spots. So it was really, it, this was um, Tilo Kuna, Dr. Tilo Kuna at the MRCP in Edinburgh who found all of these. It was quite surprising for us. So he then went to Professor Perdita Barn, who had just moved to Manchester. He'd been working with her for a while in Edinburgh. And the first surprise for them was that the odour was in the back of the neck on the collar because he had had his two PhD students and himself running around the block and they were expecting it to be under the arms. So in actual fact, they thought, oh, right, OK, so what are we going to do about this? So in actual fact, he went off and spoke to somebody and he came back. Richard says it's probably sebum if it's the back of the neck. So this is what I was presented with for the proof of analysis. Perdi decided, yes, she could do it in mass spectrometry. She could probably isolate the volatiles. Um, and they cut them in half. So the volunteers, um, some with Parkinson's, of course, control group without Parkinson's, T-shirts for 24 hours. They were asked not to shower and not to wear any perfume. Each t-shirt was cut out the back of the neck and cut in half, bagged and randomized, and I scored each t-shirt. Now, these are the results. There are two things from this. My nose gets tired, so I begin to split. So we discovered that I had to have a rest and clear out my nose. I have a little bottle, like the eye vinger cleaning of the nose. So we, we started off very nicely, and then there was this one. Now we argued for quite some time. Tilo said, no, he's in the control. I said, no, he, he can't be, he's maybe in the control, but he has Parkinson's. Eight months later, this man came back and he said, well, what did she say about mine? And uh, he said, well, actually you have to tell me. And he says, well, I've just been diagnosed with Parkinson's. So like my husband, I had pre-diagnosed somebody in the proof of concept. Now it, this may sound funny, but I thought, oh, I wonder if I could put these t-shirts back together. And I did perfectly, because I'm going to explain to you how I could do that. We had to find a bag that wasn't going to cause too many volatiles to go into the GCMS. So we got rid of the bag. Oh, I've just done a double click, sorry. So then we got rid of the swab. We tested six swabs and I found one that I thought would suit. Then I have to get rid of the scent of the person and I'm left with PD, Parkinson's. So the first level I smell is the smell of the person. The second level I smell is less of the person and more PD, which is fairly obvious. The third is very little of the person, mostly PD. And this one I have only smelt four times. It's someone who really doesn't want to know they have Parkinson's and is hiding it, we've discovered, which is sad, but that's if people want to, that's their choice. So if none of you know what is going to happen with a swab, um, our analyst, Drupad Trevedi, has done this for my talks. So 
they are put in ethanol. They are then taken out of ethanol in the machine and they go into be heated in the thermal deabsorption. They are then, they go into the coil where they are weighed. And then they come off according to their different weight. There they go. They start to come off. This takes a little while. And then they go into the mass spec to be identified. They come out of the mass spec and they go on to what is the, the international um, recognition for volatiles. Now, it has never failed to amaze me, as you will see in the next one. We are now at 97% of identification. These were the first volatiles that I were really very strong for me. Uh, one down, three up. But 50% of the volatiles go to the machine, 50% come to me. So I have a clicker and a stopper. And it takes my brain six seconds difference to actually press what I am smelling and recognizing. And when the graphs come together, they are that four to six seconds separate, but they are the same. And I'm very humbled by that and how it happens. So I'm going to introduce you to something that <laughs> your presenter is very interested in. She spoke to Alison in um, Kyoto, and we did a, a, a poster, Rediscovering Happiness, the Impact of Physical and Cognitive Exercise in Parkinson's Disease as Measured by Odor Stratification. Now, this is a one-person study. We've done it over five years. Um, I first met Alison in 2016. She was very hunched. She was shuffling. I could hardly hear her voice. She had quite a bad tremor, but she obviously had Parkinson's. Um, I then met her 18 months later and went, ah, your level has completely changed. Not saying I'm not allowed to tell people. So in my mind, I thought, what on earth has she done? So I went back to Professor Perita Barn in Manchester University and sought ethical permission to ask and do this study. So here is our poster. Here is Alison and myself. Um, we describe what happens in the GCM and the levels, but this is the interesting bit. The, Alison is a perfectionist. She is a, a, a writer. She is actually a, an award writer. Um, she is all award. She's been given several awards for her writing, but she keeps extremely good notes. And if you look at the improvements, sense of smell was restored in two years by 80%. Her mood was consistently good. Her arm swing was good. Unconsciously, 80% of the time, left-right coordination was good, timekeeping in dance. Um, David and her do um, uh, oh, the tango. They're very good at it. And they also do the, the taekwondo drumming. Um, her gait, oh, it had totally changed. Um, there was physical multitasking restored. Her energy levels were up 30%, only 30%. She still did get tired. Her dystonia in the right foot was completely gone and her light leg resting tremor had gone as well. I can't stress enough the difference that her exercise regime made her. It is a, uh, uh, with a personal trainer, but why does this happen? Is the smell level also an indication of the severity of the disease or is it an indication that the disease is increasing? We need to find this out and we are going to do this in Manchester. And it could have a role to play in treatment strategies and your own health and wellness. Now, I'm going to bring another study in here and you're going to see what it means to me. In Parkinson's, why is earlier diagnosis so important? I think the modification 
I think there is a lot of modification. Having spoken to very many people about different things they do, there is modification to how you live with. But in tuberculosis, why is earlier diagnosis so important? Children, there's 1,600 children die every day with TB. They cannot produce the sputum. So it, this is both in sebum. So what if sebum holds, can hold the signature for different diseases? This is the Apopo rat who I've worked with in Tanzania. And I'm not, I'm only a few weeks back from Tanzania uh, for the second time um, lockdown got in the way. Over 4,000 to 500,000 uh, 5,000 people die a day, but they don't, they don't, they will die if not, you know, there is a cure, but they will die, but a person does not die with Parkinson's, there's no cure and only palliative treatment, so it's a very slowly progressive disease, but there is the recognition of this prodromal phase. Now, for me, I know all about Les's prodromal phase, I smelt him within two months, three months of whatever happened. He'd had a terrible rhinitis and then the smell was there. So we look at this. So I'm very proud of this results. When my cross suggested no TB, both the hero rats and I could detect the TB and we were right. When microscopy suggested TB positive, both the hero rats and I could not detect the smell of TB, and we were right. It is quite um, mind blowing the, the work I'm doing with them. So there is proof of concept, not only in one disease, but I do have it in actually three. Can't discuss one book at the moment, but in TB and a pope are leading this. Um, they, are, they have the great African pouch strap working with them. So Parkinson's advocacy, I'm a World Parkinson's Co with the coalition. I'm on the science committee and uh, I was part of the decision making uh, for Barcelona 2023. I am also on the WPC advocacy committee um, and I'm helping the structure and putting across about uh, Barcelona 2023. I'm also a PD Avenger and I'm on the research team. Les wrote the sparks of experience, his early experience in that prodromal phase. Um, I helped him write it and um, he, he really believed in it. He was so um, in, in, invigorated by the fact we found this as a doctor. And I am also a co-member of the Women's Parkinson's group in Britain in Britain for the unmet needs, and I'm a committee member of the YOPD. Um, early diagnosis is my panacea. I have to admit, I would like to see modification of this disease, people being able to live with it far better. Um, I know from Les and I, and from other couples I've spoken to, if we had known earlier, our choices would have been different. And that's not for everybody but our choices would have been different. I'd like to thank Dr. Tilo Kuna for his belief at the beginning. It was a huge momentum for Les in his final year. I would also like to thank Professor Perdita Barn, I call her Perdi, for her friendship and support, because she does have to pick me up sometimes. There is no two ways about it. This, the, you know, the work we have done, we now have four papers out and the fifth one is about to come out with the proof of 97% correction of the um, diagnosis of PD. The, the BAN group, uh, Serendipi doesn't have anything to do with, you couldn't have put us together if you tried. We are from all over the world and we work tremendously well together. But I would also like to thank Anna Chun. I think having the dual port made the, the huge difference so that I could actually work with the volatiles and the GCMS. And the last one is my husband. As a doctor, Les believed in early diagnosis and treatment as it had been proven in other areas of medicine. He really hoped that this would make a difference in Parkinson's. And that's it, that's my talk.
No, I have to come off first, don't I? Um, I can't remember how to I'll not share. Right. No. At the top, you should have yeah, the, um, the stop, stop share. share. Yep, awesome. Oh, <laughs> So this is extraordinarily fascinating. And I think one of the first questions is, what is it you're smelling? Like, can you describe what the smell is? I, I don't describe it as a thing anymore because I now know I can identify 17 of the different volatiles. Um, and they come up again and again. But if you were to ask me three Christmases ago, I had given my son my husband's chair that he relaxed back on. It's leather with tiny cracks in it. And I put my feet up, put the seat back, and the smell just went. And I thought, oh, there you are. And it's a strange, deep, musty smell. OK. Is there a difference between the smell of men and women, or is it about the same? It depends on the time of month for women. My, I have 49 years as a carer, which is quite unusual. Um, I not only looked after my mother-in-law, I looked after my husband as well. So I know the smell of a woman with Parkinson's and uh, the smell of a man. And it is different at different times of the month for the women. That's extremely interesting. So I'm wondering if, are you aware of anyone else? I know you have family members that have this ability, um, but is there anyone else that you're aware of that has this unique skill? Um, and have you ever smelled a normal smell in someone that has Parkinson's? Does that ever happen? I, I have smelt someone with Parkinson's while I've been shopping. And I'm not, I, I am not allowed to say. I don't know whether that person has been diagnosed or not. And if that person was stopped in the street or in the shop, what would I say to them? Go to a neurologist, go to your doctor. You know, it, until the test is out and being used, I am not willing to cross that boundary. Um, the other disease I, I, I have actually smelt uh, TB in Britain and also, but there is, we know now there's TB in Britain and the other disease that I can't speak about at the moment. Um, so it's interesting. Um, I have to walk away. And uh, with it. So, the, but there's likely other people out there. We have actually somebody that was asking um, how they might be able to get rid of the smell because apparently they can smell it in their loved one. And so, if that is the case, is there something that they could do to help reduce that if it if it becomes overpowering for them? Um. I used to open Les's door in the morning, run across, open the window, run out again, and and then give him his tablets after the air was roomed for the, the room was aired for about ten minutes when he was in his last years. It does increase. Um, it increases at different times. Actually, he was an international swimmer, my husband. He swam for Scotland and he swam for Britain. If he did his swimming, his smell was better than when he didn't. Uh, as a consultant anaesthetist, his, his lists were very long and he had to retire by the time he was 50 because he could no longer hit the veins. Um, so I'm afraid it is something that persists. Um, Tilo did an nasty on me. We were filming for a European team and the team said, um, oh, what about having swabs? And he said, oh, I can get you some swabs. I'm sure I can get you some swabs. And he brought this bag and I opened it up and I thought, oh, there's just swabs in here. And I went, uh, and then I went, ha, huh, proof of concept. Now this was five years after the proof of concept. That's how you will not get rid of this smell. You could renew as much as you like in clothes and, and um, bedding and pillows, etc., etc. This smell is quite, if you smell it, yes. You smell it. I'm sorry, that's that is it. 
So you mentioned in your conversation about Allison, how she had a certain level of smell. And then when she implemented some lifestyle changes, that smell changed. So you're seeing that people who do different things, they can change it. I'm curious, does the, um, does the medications that people take like carbidopa levodopa, does that change the smell? Well, the smell does get worse if your tablets aren't working well enough. Now I know that from my husband, he was on levodopa and when he's, he wasn't on a high enough dose or taking the slow release at night, the smell had gone up. So yes, there is an indication there that this could also help with um, strategies, as I say, for tablets and life, you know, life progression of the disease. But also I think uh, Alison had changed her diet as well as her um, exercise and she got flu. Uh, there was a little tick on the bottom, uh, which I should have pointed out, but she got flu and it went up one level because she was not doing her exercise and was eating a few tasties to keep her going rather than her normal meals, you know, because she was ill and it did change. I, she said, oh, come through. I th I'm sure it has changed. I don't feel as good. So it had gone up to two, but once she was back in uh, to her exercise regime, it went back to one. That, that is incredible. And, and honestly, that is such a good or a, a unique perspective because, you know, there's been lots of studies about the, the um, impact that diet or exercise has on mm -hmm. delaying the progression of the disease. But like having that perspective of yes, and it smells different when that actually is occurring is is amazing. That's just as a supplement to what other findings we've had, but like incredible. And if they are able to capture this in a way that even all of us who smell normal can't smell it and it can be used as an early diagnostic tool, that would be an, an incredible gift to, to the Parkinson's community. Good. Yes, because I'm hoping, well, I know uh, once the, the paper comes out with the test, um, and showing the results that we now have. Um, we are immediately going to publish the paper about the smell and exercise. You will be pleased to know. <laughs> and it gives all the details. That's okay. fantastic. And I'm curious, and, and maybe you can speak to this in terms of Allison or maybe any of other subjects that you worked with, um, but one person, the person who said that they can they can smell it and they're, they're a person with Parkinson's, um, that it increases, the smell worsens or increases with anxiety. Do you see that fluctuation also, like if they're having a depression or anxiety or something like that, one of the non-motor, maybe with the on and off fluctuations? We we Les and I did experience that. Um, he he had urinary problems very near the end, and um, he became very anxious about it. As a doctor, it he didn't feel it was being treated properly. Um, it didn't look his urine didn't look right at all. And although he had improved his smell, um, we were walking, etc. This anxiety did bring it on. Now it had happened earlier, but as I wasn't aware of it, you know, when he was having difficulty hitting veins when he was still working and things like that, and long theatre periods, he would come home and the smell would be worse. So yes, anxiety does trigger it. That's interesting. So, and I'm. I don't know if you've heard of this. I'm going to make not make any assumptions, but um, do you know of anyone that has dogs that can smell? So we know somebody in the United States that has dogs that she has been training or working with to identify the smell of Parkinson's. I wonder if you've heard that or have had any conversations with anyone that has dogs like Truffle, maybe since I've dogs. worked. <laughs> yes, I've worked in Milton Keynes with the dog detection people there. Um, with Claire Guest, Dr. Claire Guest, I had Peanut and Button, 
two dogs. And uh, Perdi and I spent a couple of days at the dog detection. And um, there were there were swabs that I had um, already verified. And the, the dogs, we, we were able to train the dogs. Um, there's no two ways about it. But uh, wouldn't it be easier to have a swab across the back of your neck? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I think that's that's our aim. That is our aim. It is one. It is a Q-tip now, um, and um, one of the PhD students has actually designed a kit, and we have it all ready um, to be duplicated. Um, and then it would go back to the university, and it would be tested. So in future tests so we are hoping that that's how it's going to work it's incredibly fascinating and i know that you mentioned this a little bit at the beginning but um we had a question you sound like a scientist so can you give us a little bit more like i know you're you said you were a nurse and um, what area did you work in and and um you know and how did this impact your your nursing career I, very strangely, I speak of serendipity. Um, when the first white paper came out in Britain, uh, introducing early diagnosis and um, a family background and treatment, I became a practice nurse. I then went on to do a diploma as a lecturer in practice nursing. And I went in, I was a facilitator going into GP practices and, um, training their practice nurses, both in the college, Elizabeth Gaskell College in Manchester, and also in the practice. I also encouraged, um, I was part of the King's Foundation in research for cholesterol and what was the right exercise, et cetera, to do um, for people with heart disease, stroke, cancer, all sorts of things. So in actual fact, my nursing career really changed into my caring for Les, and now it has changed back into research. So if you speak about serendipity, it's really strange. I could have stayed in midwifery. I was quite happy in midwifery. midwifery. I was going to become a lecturer in midwifery, but it was a couple of friends said to me, oh, we're setting up practice. Would you like to be the practice nurse? And we'll go from there. So. Yes, serendipity again. I acquired the PPI, the patient public involvement um, for research. I acquired the looking at early diagnosis and how it could be, how diseases could be modified and how GPs could care more adequately for their patients. Um, so yes, my career, for some reason or other, has fitted into the three slots that I had acquired it. Um, I have done, for Parkinson's UK, I have done a um, webinar, uh, it's actually a, a training, they do get points for it, medical points for it. it, I discuss caring for a person with Parkinson's, I give tips, I tell them, I, I start this, oh, this off being extremely honest. I mean, my first lecture was done with two friends whose husbands also had Parkinson's and we stood up and said exactly as carers what we had experienced. We went through the loss of intimacy. We went through the, the changes in character. We went through the um, anxiety, depression um, and it was quite a shock to people to hear it that weren't, didn't have Parkinson's. But at the end of that lecture, now this was 17 years ago, the end of that lecture, the people with Parkinson's and their carers, I mean, we were, I am not joking, we were hugged tremendously. We were uh, engulfed by them, asking questions, saying, you know, we, we didn't want to say this or we didn't want to say that. I know things have changed now because people are far more forward thinking in, uh, and there are, like the foundations, I mean, I think you're all just wonderful. How you set out programs for people to understand. Les and I had none of this help. 
So I am so pleased to be part of it. So yes, my, my career has continued. <laughs> well, that's fantastic because you definitely have an incredible gift that can be utilized for the greater good. And actually there was a question about like how the swab test would work um, if you're not smelling each one of them. So can you break down, like, what are they hoping to be able to do in terms of, of detection once they've identified all of these volatiles and, and, and I'm not scientific. So, you know, how this would actually work for future diagnostics. We uh, uh, have now formed a, a company. We are not out to make uh, money we are out to actually start off and um, show how the test works um, we want to be able to show people that the prodromal phase is detectable and then if it can be taken into say big pharma so that they can test to see whether the drugs are going to work or if somebody wants to do go to their health professional and say look can I do another test? I've been exercising, etc. I'd like to see how my volatiles are. Now, we have opened the second paper that was done. It was entitled A Window into the Dysregulated Lipids of Parkinson's. And we are looking at the, the various lipids and they are dysregulated. There's no doubt about it. But some are higher, some are lower. But we can change that by using this test. It is not just for early diagnosis. It is there so that people can have it whenever they go to their doctors. So the, the doctor, the, the um, neurologist can see what's happening to the person and how treatment needs to be changed, etc. So that is our hope. I mean, that was Les's hope. We discussed it before he died. Um, he he hoped that this is what would happen with it. And I know that there's questions about, you know, managing the, the scent and even the fluctuation of that. Have, did you find that there was any impact by water intake? Like the more you drink, the, the more the flush flushes out, maybe the scent? We haven't done that. That was something that came up um, uh, about a year ago. We were going to have to be looking at ethnicity and diet more. There are future studies being written now that are in different countries. Um, and one of the questions is going to be asked, do you, how much do you drink water-wise in a day? And I think that's going to be very important because if you're in a hotter country, you might, or it's a different season, you might drink more. So we need to have that information so we can assess what you're asking. Understood, very interesting. And another person had written in saying that they, they use um, alcohol in a cotton ball and they swab their, their spouse's neck and forehead in the morning and that it comes off yellow. That's the sebum mm -hmm. and, and the lipids. And that's all all our tips are usually varying, varying yellow from mild cream to yellow. It, that's interesting. That is, that person has collected a very good of the sebum. Mm. And you mentioned some, some slight differences in women, especially with different times of the month. Are there any differences at all in different race and ethnicities? Well, that is our next, as I was saying, that is our next um, part of uh, the research. Um, we do have protocols ready for uh, working with different doctors in different countries, different neurologists in different countries. And so we will be going ahead with that soon which is very interesting. And we do have a, a variety of ethnicities in the 4,000 swabs we've already done. Um, so we're not seeing enough 
of the change. If they're in Britain, do are they having a, a British diet or are they having half and half? We need to get more information on diet, uh, water and ethnicity um, when we go forward. And this has all been uh, in the, the future protocols. Will they be including anyone in the US? Because I think it would be interesting to compare. <laughs> we have a different we diet. Will be, <laughs> we, will be, we will be going around the world. Um, we are now working with Harvard. So in fact, yes. Um, so there will be studies that will be open to people in the US. And I think we're already getting people willing to, to volunteer to be in the study. So I don't think you're going to have any trouble enrolling any uh, participants in that. That would be very, very nice. <laughs> Another person wrote, it would be great to have a home test for self-monitoring, such as diabetics have. So like if they're doing yes. all the different behavioral modifications, diet modifications, that they can kind of see. Sometimes we like to have like analytics to let us know, hey, what we're doing is actually, you know, working aside from maybe the anecdotal uh, feeling of, yeah, I think this is actually working feel a little better. We've done the first stage. I, it was a, a real eye-opener to me. I have to say, at 72, doing an app that people could put all this in. And so we sat down with the company and it was going to be a week. It was going to be five days. So we started off as a group and they got to know us. We got to know them. And then the post-its went up and there was big sheets of paper on the wall. It was, it was a decent sized room. By, the, by Thursday, I was looking at the walls thinking, my goodness, how could we have all these ideas and want to ask all these questions? There were hundreds of post-its there. So we had to sit down. When we started on the Thursday, we were separated then because El Dr. Elna Sinclair is the actual person who tests with the GCMS. Um, Drupa Trivedi, Dr. Drupa Trivedi is our analyst. And then it was me as the person who smells and joins them both together. So in actual fact, it was extremely interesting to see how we divided up those so that the first part, the first part of the um, app was actually done before lockdown. So it will progress. You will be pleased to hear. That's that's just incredible. Like just the 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 possibilities in the future of of what we can do from your your gift. So there is a great question here from Ken. He's like, has any work been done with or on a breathalyzer type of device, or is there any odor component to it ex exhaled air, or is it just sebum? I have done um, breathomics with the other disease I'm not willing to speak about and done it with 100%. Um, with the rats and TB, I, ha I, I did get eight out of 12 samples right on breathomics, but I have never done Parkinson's with breathomics. So I have done breathomics in the other two diseases. So it's quite interesting that why, why we've done breathomics and urine in one of the diseases is that 1,600 children die a day of TB and they can't spit sputum out. So we have to have another biomarker. Mm -hmm. So yes. There is, um, and, and I know myself, it wasn't only just the smell in the back of his neck uh, and on his pillow and these t-shirts and his shirts and things. Les's breath did change. Uh, I kept on saying to him, you've not brushed your teeth. And he would turn around, I have, but you do get quite upset with me. I have brushed my teeth. Oh, well, it doesn't smell like it. He said, well, I can't help that. I have brushed my teeth. So yes, yeah, there is this um, ongoing <laughs> uh, look at the different biomarkers, but 
sebum for some reason or other, it, it is this trap. I mean, it's really greasy. Um, there may be a disease that doesn't require us to have that greasiness, but we haven't come across one yet. We can get the results we need out of sebum. So it's quite interesting. Um, and why? Why does the body excrete this extra sebum when it's ill? You, we have to ask that question. Mm -hmm. We really do. Well, I think you're you're starting that question that that to be asked. So we all do appreciate that. Um, and you know, I'm really curious, like when people are taking multiple medications, maybe for other medical conditions, and we know that the skin does excrete uh, yes. as well. So do you notice an impact if people are taking many other medications outside of just their Parkinson's meds? Um, has that ever thrown off any of the samples? No, it doesn't throw off the volatiles because we are looking for certain volatiles that we already know. However, we must know what other medications they are taking so that if it's diabetes, I mean, I can identify the ketones, et cetera, of diabetes, no bother at all. So, um, and that was because my great aunt had it and I knew from a very young age what you know, the ups and downs of the smell of diabetes was. So I think it's, it's a part of the efficiency of the research um, group that we know all the medication that there and all the other problems that are affecting them. As you know, there is now this um, insulin resistance, which is being recognized within Parkinson's. And many Parkinson's people do have, like Alison, um, she won't mind me saying she has, um, she has diabetes. Um, so we have to know levels of care, um, and pharm you know, pharmaceutical um, drugs, etc. So that is all taken into account. But there are there's a wide number of volatiles on the scale for the world. There are so many things that are oh, everything has volatiles. So there is an awful lot of them are recognised. So we have taken the group that. I have recognized and the machine is now recognizing and those are specific to Parkinson's people. It's just, it's, it's just absolutely fascinating. So we have time for a couple more questions if there are any more. I mean, you've thoroughly covered this. It is extremely fascinating. I know that um, many of us are very excited about where this is going in the future and look forward to, you know, these studies being published and, and you know, expanding into other countries and, and other, you know, including other races and all of that. So, you know, I, I am just so thankful that you were willing to put yourself out there in something that is so unique. Um, and, and this is a good point from Walt. He's like, there must be many people who can identify disease by smell as joy can. How can we organize these people so they can communicate and with and recognize one another or maybe even come together and be a part of some of the, the work that you're doing? Because the more people, the, you know, the, maybe the faster we'll be able to get some results. Um, we have had, uh, we are in contact with a few people. Um, we have had contact from several people um uh asking so we are um not counting that out that is something that is in progress <laughs> awesome and yes rachel uh put in the link for anyone who wants to join pd avengers anyone can join pd avengers so um oh, please we do. Yes, please be a part of that. And you can grab that link there in the chat. 
Joy, you know, I, I can just tell you that there's a few comments here that people are thankful for your gift, that you live up to your name, Joy, because you are a Joy, and what you're doing is bringing Joy to people, just being able to be part of the solution to things. So I want to thank you for being a part of this conversation, sharing this, because it is extremely fascinating. Um, it's encouraging. And I have uh, one comment. I yes. have one comment to that. If I go, you know, I have now, I can now measure five bacillus in TB and I can diagnose it. Yet somebody would say, well, that is just mind blowing. But I say, no, it is not the same as living your life with someone who has Parkinson's, who you're losing, who has problems. I cannot, there is nothing for me that is more important than modifying this disease and getting help for you all. And thank you for what you're contributing to that. So um, I think everybody is already giving you the claps and, and we do this wave of gratitude. And, you know, not only did you share all this, this wonderful information, but you did it in the evening So because you're joining us from Scotland. Like, we just thank you for your dedication and appreciate you. So we have a tradition at PMD Alliance where we, we give our speakers the wave of gratitude because you can see some of our folks on the screen and they that's their way of thanking you. Um, so everyone, I'm gonna invite you. you to do the wave of gratitude to Joy. <laughs> we do appreciate thank you, you thank so you. <laughs> much. Thank you so much. Fascinating. This is being recorded and um, will be up on our website. We're actually waiting to find out if she can get um, approval with the university that she's working with um, that we can share the slides and we should have that information within the day or so. So just check the recording because that's where we put the slides. They may be there if she's able to get final approval. Um, and that way you can go back and look at some of the things that she was referencing. But thank you so much, Joy. Thank you everyone for joining us today and become a PD Avenger. <laughs> yes, do, please. <laughs> it's been an honor. Night-night, everybody. Night-night. <laughs>